Today, we are diving into a disturbing compilation of True 911, Women Who Kill. Did you know that recent stats from the US show that the number of male murder offenders is almost seven times the number of female offenders? In January 2014, Jose Patricio Hernandez disappeared. His ex-girlfriend had called to report him missing from his apartment after friends, family, and colleagues couldn't find the 38-year-old. Auto 911. Yes, ma'am. Um, I need an officer to come to the apartment of Holland, Michigan, 49424. Yes, ma'am. What's the problem there? Um, I'm, I can't find, um, a friend of mine that's, uh, in his apartment. He's my ex. And I came over and I've come over two times already and the, the bed has, is made. He hasn't laid on it. And his car has been on apparently since six o'clock this afternoon. And I don't find him and I don't see him anywhere. Okay. And I don't know what else to do. Okay. What is your name? My name's Marianne Inohota. Okay, spell your last name for me, Marianne. H-I-N-O-J-O-S-A. Okay, H-I-N-O-J-O-S-A? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what is your friend's name? Um, Jose Hernandez. Jose Hernandez? Yes. H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z? Yes, yes. Does he live here by himself? No, my son lives here. I used to live there up until like five months ago. Um, and we just all got back, my son, myself, and my, because I got married, my husband. We come, from, we came from California. Okay, so uh, who does we, Jose live in the house with right now? Is it just him? My son, my uh, oldest son. How old is your oldest son? He's 19. Is he home? Um, no, he, I just saw him, and he was, um, with his friends. But, you know, he says that he saw the car that was on at 6 o'clock. He didn't know it was on right now. I'm the one, I checked it, and it's on. Okay. And so did your son know where Jose might, when was the last time your son saw Jose? Um, I don't know when he saw him. See, they don't, Jose works third shift, and then he gets out and he sleeps during the day. So my son is in and out. They hardly see each other. Okay. Where, where does he work? Um, he works at Royal Technology. At Royal Technologies. And what, what is his shift time? What time is he supposed to be there? He's supposed to be there at 12. And ma'am, he's not a person to be late. Anybody will tell you. Do you think he, he might have gotten a ride? He's an hour. Oh, no, no, his car is on. No, okay. his car is on. What kind of car does he have? A Honda, a Honda Civic. And it's been parked outside running since 6 p.m.? Well, I don't know if it's been on since 6 p.m., but my son saw it on at 6 p.m., and then I went over there right now, and um, I saw the lights on, and when I got close to it, because it's a new car, you don't really hear the motor or anything. Okay. You can hear that it's on. Okay, so it's running right so now. So I don't know. What color is it? It's a white one. Okay. So then you went into the apartment inside? Yes. And he's yes. not there? No. And I went there earlier today at 4, and he was asleep. He sleeps at this time. Was he sleeping at 4 o'clock? No, he wasn't there, and the bed is exactly the way it was before. Okay, so you went at 4 o'clock, and the, he was not there. You, was his car there at 4 o'clock? I don't know. I didn't see it. i tell you the truth. I didn't check it. I mean, I... Okay. Um, but okay. Did I, I don't remember. Okay, it's all right. All right, Marianne. And so now you're there, the car is there, but his... His no, I'm not there. I'm on my way back because I went to go ask his sister if she's heard from him, and she said no, and um, they didn't know where he's at, so I gave them the address, and they're going to meet me there right now. I'm going back. Okay, what is, your, what is his date of birth? Do you know his date of birth? <sighs> March 17, 75. Okay. All right, we're going to send an officer over for you, okay? Please. And you're, yes. you're, you're going to be there in how many minutes? I'm one block away right okay, now. All right. Okay. We'll send the police for you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Jose Patricio Hernandez was later found dead next to his running car at Amberwood Apartments in Park Township. His lifeless body was bloodied and covered in snow. His sister made the gruesome discovery. An autopsy report showed that Hernandez was ambushed and sustained blows to the head. He died of blunt force trauma to the head. His death was ruled a homicide. 
Hernandez's niece said her uncle was always joking and making people laugh. She called him energetic, saying, he just lifted your spirits up. He was a good friend to many people. Suspicions quickly switched to Hernandez's ex-girlfriend, Marianne Castorena. She was accused of scheming the murder plot with Anthony de la Garza in order to receive more than $1 million in Hernandez's life insurance, 401k, and stock option funds. Shockingly, the victim had bought his ex-girlfriend a car, paid her bills, and supported her and her sons financially. In opening statements, prosecutors told jurors the case involved greed and selfishness. De La Garza, who pleaded guilty in August to second-degree murder, was a key witness. He agreed to testify against Castorena. Deep in my heart, I had to do the right thing and come forward and tell the truth. De La Garza testified that Castorena had come up with the idea to kill Hernandez. She offered him $750,000 to kill her partner, which he did by bludgeoning the victim with a metal rod as he warmed his vehicle before his morning commute. De La Garza described how he attacked Hernandez. He hid behind a car and ambushed Hernandez with a heavy car ball joint remover, striking him in the head several times. He also testified that Castorena wrote a checklist outlining the killing of Hernandez. 40-year-old Castorena pleaded not guilty to charges including conspiracy and solicitation of first-degree murder, insisting De La Garza acted on his own. According to investigators, the woman was accused of writing a letter explaining how the killing would happen. Castorena maintained her innocence and claimed the document was part of a book or movie script she planned to write. The letter was allegedly written for De La Garza. They have the truth. It's in those papers. It's in interviews. But they can turn around because they have the law. How do we defend ourselves against people like that? She was found guilty of first-degree murder, solicitation of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and providing false information to a peace officer. No reasonable person could look at the facts of this case and determine that you were innocent of this crime. You are clearly guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Her co-conspirator, Anthony Alfredo de la Garza, was found guilty of second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit second-degree murder. He was sentenced to up to 20 to 40 years in prison. Today is one of the hardest days of my life. No, it is nothing compared to what Rita and her family has gone through. Castorena then appealed the ruling. However, her murder conviction was upheld. The Court of Appeals judges agreed the evidence was properly used to show proof of the defendant's motive, which in the murder case was life insurance money. The judges wrote, evidence that defendant was involved in another conspiracy with De La Garza to commit a crime in order to obtain insurance proceeds was logically relevant. In interviews years later, the Hernandez family said although Anthony De La Garza had apologized to them, Marianne Castorena still maintained she was not involved. Really quick, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, NordVPN. Browsing the internet has changed, and in 2022, there have never been more rules and regulations surrounding how you browse the internet. As a fan of True911 Calls, you deserve to have the true power of browsing at your fingertips. Entertainment is segmented by country, with each geographical location containing different sets of content you can watch. NordVPN bundles this service together, providing a secure and completely private browsing experience. Nobody needs to know just how much 911 stories you are addicted to. Your secrets are safe with Nord. On top of surfing privacy, Nord allows you to access even more true crime content, not always available in your current location. Assume the identity of somebody from Nepal or watch our videos from a beach in Mexico. Using NordVPN allows you to simulate your location to be anywhere in the world. Go to nordvpn.com slash truecalls, or click the link in the description to get an exclusive discount on the two-year plan plus free anti-malware. And you too can pretend you're watching from anywhere in the world. It's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. In January 2019, multiple calls were made from Michael Redlick's Florida home. He was killed by his wife, Danielle, who allegedly waited 11 hours before calling the police. She has claimed her actions were in self-defense. 911, do you need police, fire, medical? Yes. Uh, we need a car here at 1231 Temple Drive, Winter Park, Florida. There's a woman that's a danger to herself and to others right now. Pardon me? 
Or leave the address. 1231 Temple Drive, Winter Park, Florida. Okay, stay on the line. I'm going to have to transcribe over to Winter Park. Let me talk first when they answer, okay? You better go in your room. Please dance. 911, do you need police, fire, or medical? Let's just send off the transfer for police at 1231 Temple Drive. Yeah, please. Don't you run. Will you stop? All right. I'll call, I will call you back. I'll call you back in five minutes. No. I'll call you back in five minutes. Uh, what is going on there? Hello? Hunter Park, this is... Yeah, I'm still there. He um he didn't give me a lot of information. He just said that there was a woman who was a danger to, her, to herself. Okay. And that and, was it. Yeah, that's all. And he called on a 911 only phone, so... Okay. And I just want to confirm, he told you 1231 Temple Drive? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Seminole. Not a problem. Uh, bye bye. Seminole, what do you need to call your medical? Uh, medical. I don't know. I think my husband is deceased. I've been trying to get my home. What's the What's the address up there? One two three one Temple Drive, Winter Park. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Winter Park jurisdiction. Let me get um their fire department on the line. Hold on one moment. This is someone with a medical transfer for 1231 Temple Drive in Winter Park. Them too. 
Mm-hmm. Were your kids there last night during this altercation? No, they were not. They were not here, okay. and they're not here now. I know you first said that you thought he had a heart attack. So do you think it was a heart attack, or do you think it was due to the stabbing that he passed away? Um, probably the stabbing triggered it, I guess. I don't know. It's a shoulder wound. You say it's a shoulder wound? Right. I'm just getting all this information. Okay. How old are you, huh? Uh, I'm 45. I'm just getting everything you told me into the call, okay? I have multiple mm-hmm. units throughout, meaning I have police and advice. Go ahead and give me your husband's first name. Michael. Michael. What's his last name? Redlick, R-E-D-L-I-C-K. Go ahead and give me his date of birth. Um, 5-1-53. 911, you need police, fire, medical. Hello, 911. Hello. Danielle. Hello, this is a 911 operator on a recorded line. Your phone dialed into 911. Do you have an emergency? Oh, um, I've already spoke to them. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Winter Park 911, you need police, fire, and medical. This is someone with a medical transfer for 1231 Temple Drive. But Danielle's accounts of what happened did not seem to add up to detectives, who observed bloody towels, a bloody mop, bloody footprints, and the strong smell of bleach in the house. Detectives found a large, bloodied serrated knife on the floor and three bloody knives in the sink with blood on them. They also determined that the wounds to his torso were not self-inflicted, but a homicide. 65-year-old Michael Redlick was a former and beloved NBA executive for the Memphis Grizzlies, and at the time of his death, he was a professor at the University of Central Florida. Michael and his allegedly estranged wife, Danielle, had purportedly had issues in their marriage surrounding infidelity. When police were first informed about what led to his death 11 hours after it happened, Danielle had claimed that he had suffered from a heart attack after stabbing himself with a knife during their argument. But later, Danielle had contended that their fight began when she had been in the kitchen eating a hamburger. She alleged that the man had taken a bite from the burger and spat a piece of it in her face, then pushed her to the ground. In a chilling interview with friends of the victim, he had once described his soon-to-be ex-wife as crazy, joking that as long as he hides the steak knives, he would be fine. The couple, who were both found with visible defensive wounds on the day of the altercation that led to Michael's demise, had reportedly been going through a divorce since the previous November, where Danielle had filed for divorce suspecting Michael of cheating. She had described their 17-year-long marriage as irretrievably broken. She had listed herself as an unemployed photographer and had asked for alimony as she could not afford to support herself financially. She had also requested shared custody to their 15-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son. The case for the divorce was eventually dismissed due to a lack of action from Danielle, who had initiated court proceedings. As investigations into Michael's murder continued, detectives uncovered shocking details of the couple's broken relationship, including the unbelievable yet true past that revealed that Danielle was once Michael's stepdaughter. According to a friend of the couple, Danielle's mother had married Michael due to suffering from a terminal illness requiring medical treatment that he could financially provide for. When she passed, Danielle and Michael began dating and shortly after got married. Police also found an entry in Danielle's journal stating that she believed he was seeing another woman. This sparked the belief that she may have killed her estranged husband in a fit of jealous rage. 
In Danielle's second description of the incident, she claimed that after pushing her to the ground, she had responded by taking a knife out of a drawer in an attempt to protect herself. She claimed that Michael had grabbed the knife out of her hand and had stabbed himself. She had reportedly run to hide in the bathroom, and when she came out, she found a bloody trail leading to his body in the living room of his home and one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Orlando, Winter Park. She reported that the reason she had waited over 11 hours to contact 911 was that the woman had collapsed after attempting CPR on him and upon waking, slit her wrists and reached 911 when she couldn't stop the bleeding. She was taken to hospital, where she admitted to authorities that the argument had stemmed from Danielle's communications with another man. In further investigations of the events that fateful day, police noted that they had found deleted messages exchanged between the couple and a dating app on Danielle's phone. According to authorities, she had reviewed messages on the app two hours before calling 911. The 45-year-old was arrested by police in February 2019 for second-degree murder and tampering with evidence. She was held at Orange County Jail without bond. She was offered a plea deal in February 2020, where she would serve just over 10 years in prison for manslaughter, but she rejected the deal. Danielle's claim of self-defense will go to trial. There has not yet been a date set for the next court hearing. If you're a true 911 fan and haven't subscribed yet, hit that red button and turn on notifications so you don't miss new uploads. Patricia Hill shot her 65-year-old husband in July 2018 when she became enraged that he had purchased a channel dedicated to sexually graphic content. She confessed and was charged with murder. 911. Yes, I need a police and ambulance out to Donaldson Lane. My husband's been shot. Who shot him, ma'am? I did. Um, um, we are arguing or something, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Let me try to reach an ambulance service, okay? Is he up breathing? I don't know. I don't know. Are you still there? Yes. Hold on. I'm trying to reach an ambulance service. Do you still have a gun, ma'am? No. Ambulance service. No one transfer. Yes. I need an ambulance and a police at Donaldson Lane. Hey, what's going on? Uh, my husband's been shot. Okay. And where is he shot at, do you know? Uh, in the leg, I think. Okay. Uh, is the person that shot him still there? Yes. Okay. Uh, what's your telephone number? Uh, All right, Mecca. I got him on the way. All right, let us know when things are secure. All right. Thank you. Ma'am. A woman that many know as a churchgoer, Sunday school teacher, and nurse of 50 years shockingly killed her third husband, Frank Hill, after discovering that he had purchased a pornography channel. Hill's attorney, Bill James, told KATV her first husband had a mental illness and her second husband had problems drinking. This was reportedly the second time that he had ordered a channel of this nature and the 69-year-old's attorney said she just snapped when she shot at her husband's feet. According to the killer, she had an estranged marriage with Frank, and since 2001, the two have been fighting over the obscene content. She had reportedly asked him to stop many times, but even when she went into his shit to confront him, he was watching porn and quickly turned it off. He was also allegedly drunk on the day he died. Patricia reportedly does not remember fetching the 22 caliber, but she had it and shot it at her husband's feet as he was bending down. The accused hadn't intended to kill him when she pulled the trigger, she was simply trying to get his attention. She was facing capital punishment, but her defense was hoping to fight for a shorter sentence due to Hill's mental illness. James argued that Hill had been pushed beyond her level of endurance in an unhappy marriage and years of depression, and that had caused her to be filled with a rage that rendered her incapable of comprehending the illegality or consequences of her actions. While the jury was considering her fate during her first trial, Defense attorney Bill James asked for a mistrial after the court learned that a piece of evidence, a report from the state psychologist, was not given to the jury. While waiting for the court to decide on a mistrial, prosecutors and James negotiated a 16-year prison sentence for Hill. Hill was found guilty of second-degree murder sentenced to 16 years, 
she would be eligible for parole after serving eight years in prison. Hill's family and friends described her as a caring person who cared for just about anyone. A 20-year-old woman smothered her own baby to death straight after sending the child's father a photograph of her with a twisted message saying, sorry, just thought you deserved one last picture in memory of her. Can I have the answer, please? Are you the patient? Look at my daughter, she's not breathing. She's not breathing? No. She's not breathing at all? No. What's the address of the emergency, please? And how old is your daughter? Two. Two years old? Yeah. She's not breathing at all? No. Okay, help is being arranged. You need to stand the telephone with me and listen very carefully. I'm going to tell you what to do to help, okay? I need you to lie flat on her back on the floor. Can you do that for me now? Um, ow! Oh. You need to put you onto the floor for me, okay? I'm going to tell I you how to help. Move. Every time I move, it hurts. Pardon? Every time I move, it hurts. Right, but we need to help your daughter if she's not breathing. <laughs> You need to lay a slap on her back on the floor for me, please. It was a normal day at work for Paul Hogan on October 10th, 2016, until his life was turned upside down. Police arrived at his workplace and arrested him for the involvement in the death of his daughter, Macy Hogan. When the harrowing truth was that it was the toddler's mother, Cody Ann Jackson, who murdered her own child in what some have said was an act of revenge against her ex-boyfriend, who recently moved out of the family home. Jackson called 999 shortly after, and police found the killer attempting CPR on the child. According to police reports, Jackson had superficial chest, neck, and wrist injuries that appeared to be self-inflicted. The toddler suffered significant brain damage and was not breathing when authorities found her. Police also found a suicide note that Jackson had written before taking the life of her own child. There's nothing for me or Macy here. Life is shit. At first, Jackson claimed that she woke up and found Macy's cold body next to her in bed, in between two pillows. Shortly before the killing, the woman had sent Paul Hogan, father of Macy and her ex-partner, a sick and twisted text that read, Sorry, just thought you deserved one last picture in memory of her. She also mentioned seeing him in court, which could have been connected to an impending custody hearing after their relationship fell apart. But since that day ended with the brutal murder of little Macy, the text could have had a much more sinister undertone, an act that has been described by Judge Chambers, the recorder of Stafford, as an expression of utter self-absorption. In July 2017, Jackson pleaded guilty to her evil deed. She was sentenced to life behind bars with a minimum of 16 years and 114 days for murder. During the hearing, Judge Chambers told her, I accept that may not have come easy, but this remains a very serious case. For a mother to kill her young child, who depends on her for protection above all others, is a wicked and appalling act. This is not a case where you suffered from mental illness. The clear inference is that you thought about killing yourself and decided to kill Macy as well to prevent her having a life without a mother. Paul has told reporters that he has not been the same since the death of his daughter, saying the murder has destroyed his life. The grieving father has not even been able to hold down a job since the killing. Sometimes I think about what she would be like now, but I try to push it to the back of my mind as much as I can. Nothing can help. When you lose a child like that, Nothing can help you. Just hours after celebrating their 18th wedding anniversary, Sandra Garner made a call to 911 to report that an intruder shot her husband. 911, why is your emergency? I need somebody to come. I need a police. I need an ambulance. My husband was shot. Okay, what happened there? There was a man here. And he shot him. And he told me. Not to call the police. And do you know where the male subject went? No, I was in Bedford, and he told me to sit down and count to 100 and not to call the police until I got to 100. He said if I called you before I reached 100, he'd come back and kill me. Please hurry. I think he's still alive. He's making noises. Please. What can I do for him? You, you want to try to do CPR? Yes. Yes. I need to lay him flat on his back on the ground and remove any pillows. On the ground? You want me to get him off the bed? Yes, ma'am, if possible. We need to try to do some compression. Okay. okay. He's on the floor. One, two, three, four. One, four. two, three, four. One, two, 
When the police arrived at the Garner residence in Maypearl, Texas, John Garner had been mortally wounded. The 42-year-old was dead on the scene. Distraught, Garner had to be carried from the bedroom to the living room by the police deputies. According to Garner, the intruder shot John three times, with every moment captured on police body cameras. The premises were checked for the alleged gunman, but found no traces of the man Garner claims to have seen. According to Garner, she was awakened that night by two gunshots and saw a masked male holding a gun and flashlight. I woke up and then I heard gunshot. You heard a gunshot? I heard two gunshots. And then somehow I ended up on the floor beside the bed. She claimed that the gunman told her he was not there to harm her, but a work-related grudge against her husband, John. Because I lost my house, I lost my life. The gunman forced Garner to open a safe and give him approximately $18,000. Furthermore, she was instructed to go into the bathroom and count to 100 until he left. Hours after Sandra's questioning, she went to be with the extended Garner family. When questioned about John and what happened to him, none of the family members believed her. Did you believe her? I did. Did everybody in the room believe her? No. Garner's son, Wes Miller, quickly cast the blame on his mother for the murder. In less than 24 hours after her husband had been shot, Garner went back to her house. In an interview with CBS, Sandra said she felt that she needed to be there. It was a little weird, yes, but I knew I needed to be there. Why? I just felt like that's where John would want me to be. And I was really hoping that the guy would come back. You were. So yeah. I could kill him. <laughs> After obtaining a search warrant to search the couple's home and vehicles, investigators found a bullet in a pillowcase inside the Garner's bedroom and seized several electronic devices. The investigators were shocked to learn that in the days before the murder, someone searched for how can I kill someone as they sleep on Garner's iPad which made her more of a suspect. Medications like fentanyl were also found in her search history. Additionally, a 38 caliber pistol was also found in her Ford Mustang. Police said the gun, which matched the one that was used to kill John Garner, had been wrapped in a paper towel and hidden inside two plastic bags. Gunshot residue was found on both of Garner's hands. Garner went from being a victim of a home invasion to a person of interest. The Maypearl Police Department made a statement on Facebook saying, We have reason to believe that the shooting was not a stranger-on-stranger -stranger home invasion. Sandra was then brought back in for a second round of questioning. I need you to be honest. I tried, I swear I'm trying to be honest with you. I don't, you don't think I'm being honest? No. Garner was arrested eight days after John's death on murder charges and held at the Ellis County Jail on a $2 million bond. The prosecutors ridiculed Sandra's story that an intruder used her gun to kill John. Poor police work was also brought into question. Was the crime scene secured, in your view, quickly enough to preserve the, all the evidence? No. I probably should have taken her out of the house and put her in a car. I probably should have bagged her hands, and I should have done some other things. Garner's defense team argued the gunshot residue found on both her hands did not prove her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They argued further that Garner had no motive to kill John because of her declining health. At the time of John's murder, Garner had multiple sclerosis. She was found not guilty of murder in 2019 after a four-week trial. This true 911 call was made in March 2015 by the devastated aunt of three-month-old baby girl, Janaya Watkins. The caller's son found her decapitated body on the kitchen counter and rushed to tell the aunt, who had custody of the child, as she had been asleep. She immediately called the police. Sunshine, I want to rotate yourself your emergency. Somebody please send the police. My niece okay, killed her baby. Please. <laughs> what is the address? Uh, 5957 Wildwood. Okay, ma'am. Who, help me. Oh who were you God. just talking? You were just talking to somebody. Who were you just talking to? My 
my son. He came over here. He found the Bible asleep. I mean, and he had his kids in to go to school because they go from my house. And he seen the baby on the my sister. Oh, my God, help me. Hey, listen to me. Listen to me. I need you to stop. Stop crying, okay? Stop crying. Oh I need you to help. I need you to take a deep breath and tell me what happened. Ma'am, please send the police right away. Ma'am, you weren't crying when you. But I heard you talking to him. You were fine. And then when I picked up, you started crying. I need you to tell me what's going on. I am crying. I'm outside screaming. What happened? But he keeps telling me to calm down. I don't what know happened? What all I know is my son came in here and woke me up and said, Mama, the baby's dead. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What am I going to do because she killed this baby? Oh, God. Okay, why, why are you saying she killed the baby? Because the baby is in the room. Here, talk to my son, brother. Come to me, I can't talk to How me. old is the baby? The baby is three months. Oh, my God, I'm going to kill Hello? What happened? Police. I don't know. This house is big. I don't know where my little cousin at. So can you please? Where is the three-month-old baby? Ba the baby, lady. The baby is on my mama's kitchen counter with his head smashed. Now I need you to please send me. Okay, is it a male or female? Know where my little cousin is at. Now if I go a girl pop up with a weapon, I'm not gonna have a little cousin no more. So can you please? Just, I know. I know this part of the Can you please just send the police? Especially okay, here. we. I need to know what happened to the baby. I don't know what happened to the baby. I came into the house. She told me. We came into the house. The baby was on the counter. My mom was in the bed asleep. I woke my mom up, and we calling you. That's all I know. I don't know nothing else. I have a little cousin. She was here. I don't know. Okay, what okay, okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. Look, is the baby breathing? Listen, lady. The baby is deceased. Okay, okay. Is, all right, we're help. sending the police and an ambulance, right. okay? Mama. What is your name, sir? Mama. Sir. Hello. What is your name? I'm Robert Stewart. And who is the mother of the child? Huh? Who is the mother? The Asia. Oh, what is the Asia last name? Watkins. The is she Asia there Watkins. right now? No, I don't know where she's at. That's the problem. I don't know where this little girl is at. I don't even know if she's in this house. It's a, it's a big house, lady. Please. I'm not, I don't want to look for her. I don't want to look for her. So if you please, please send the police. Listen to me, sir. We already have the run started, okay? All right. So no one has any idea what happened to the child? Listen, lady. You can, I cannot explain to you what happened because I do not know. Nobody knows. It happened sometime in the middle of the night. Okay. That's can you, what, what, what do you see when you look at the child? What? Children, look, look, lady. I don't want to describe the scene. This screen is very, very bad. All right, the little lady, the little baby, head is open, like okay. open, open. I'm, I'm, I'm not going in there to touch nothing, cause I don't want to mess nothing up. I'm not going in there to look, cause I already seen it. But it's not. It's very violent. It's a very okay. violent scene. All right, it's very violent. All right, sir. Very we have violent. police and fire department responding out. All right, I, I gotta go back to the car, cause my kids is outside. I don't know where this girl is at now. Ma. I need you to use it. Go lock yourself in here or I'm finna go because I gotta go out here with them. Then come outside, ma. You gotta pick because I gotta be out there with them. My kids are scared. I'm not looking nowhere because if I see her, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Mommy, I'm ready to die. I'm not gonna die. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Miss Stewart. Yes, can I call my aunt, please? Okay, can I speak? Else. Can I speak to your mom? Mom, the lady want to talk to you. Hello. Okay, ma'am, listen to me. Okay, we have help on the way. What I'm do you think happened? What do, oh what do you think happened? Oh my God! What happened to the baby? I don't know. My son wouldn't let me go. He just, I don't know. I wouldn't die. Can you die. Talk about your daughter? Killing my the baby. Niece, I want to call my daughter. I'm scared. <laughs> okay, so nobody can tell me what happened. No, my niece is killed. Oh my god. Okay, all right, we get help on the way, okay? I'm so scared. Oh my god, I'm a jet. Oh my god, I'm gonna. Oh my god. Oh my God! What am I gonna do? Oh my God! In my house! What was he doing in my house? Oh my God, Mel, Mel! Oh my God! They're on their way, okay? The baby's mother, 20-year-old Deasia Watkins, was charged with aggravated murder after she was found with her dead baby lying on a counter. It's alleged that a group of children raised the alarm around 6 a.m. on that Monday morning. 
after finding Watkins with the baby's body inside the home. Watkins' aunt, Caritha White, believed Hamilton County Family Services had failed the infant, saying they had done everything they could. In the weeks leading up to the tragic event, law enforcement and child services had documented a troubling relationship between Watkins and her baby. In January 2015, police responded to a call from neighbors of James Brown, father of Janaya, saying they heard Watkins screaming and the baby crying. The neighbor, Chris Gully, recalled the events in an interview with WCPO9. According to Chevy at police, Watkins was screaming at the child to stop crying. Chris Gully was there and told officers she'd been acting strange the last couple of weeks, talking in tongues and acting crazy. She kept calling us like the devil and stuff like that. Like she kept saying we were sinning so much we when we didn't realize we were sinning that we need to come to the light. Officials found her high on marijuana and speaking in tongues. Family members stated that Watkins had been hospitalized and diagnosed with postpartum psychosis, which she had been prescribed an antipsychotic, called Risperdal, for but it was unclear whether she had been taking it or not. It was during this incident that the infant had to be forcefully taken from Watkins by police as she refused to let go of her child. White was given temporary custody of the three-month-old, and the mother had been banned from any contact with her child after the hospitalization. Janaya was left in the custody of her aunt, who, despite the fact that Watkins had been forbidden to be near her child by child services, allowed her to move in with her and the baby roughly one week prior to the murder. The baby's father spoke to WCPO9, saying there was never any obvious threats from Watkins. I'm, I'm lost. I'm lost right now. James Brown says there were never any obvious threats. DeAsia Watkins never talked to him about wanting to hurt their baby, but he said she was acting strange. Did you ever try and talk to her? Did you ever try to you know, get her to see what was going on in her head? I mean, we, we, we talked, but it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was her when she was talking to me at the, at the time. Like, it was different. Like, her, the way she acted was different. According to the Hamilton County Coroner, Lakshmi Samarco's report, the three-month-old infant sustained multiple stab wounds to the right side of her face and head to the point that the coroner had lost count, and her head was severed from her body. Sources say that the knife had been placed into the hand of the infant. Although Watkins was offered a plea deal in 2016, she refused it, pursuing an insanity plea instead. It was only after several months that Watkins was found competent to stand trial after undergoing psychiatric evaluation. Her lawyer, Norman Albin, spoke out after the finding. I think it's a lot harder to make this kind of defense if you had no mental health history whatsoever, and all of a sudden it's, oh, I guess I was insane the day this happened. But if you have a lengthy history of tr mental trauma, of incidents like that, I think it's, it's easier to support a finding of not guilty by reason of insanity. The verdict would be dependent on whether or not she would be found not guilty by reason of insanity. If convicted for aggravated murder, Watkins would face 15 years to life in prison. However, in February 2017, Watkins pled guilty to the murder of her three-month-old baby, Janaya, and was sentenced to 15 years in prison with eligibility for parole after 13 years. Although Watkins had previously refused a plea deal, her lawyers found conflicting reports in the doctor's statements as to whether she did indeed have a mental illness or not. According to the prosecution, there was significant evidence that she understood the wrongfulness of her actions. Her own attorneys acknowledged the gruesomeness of the murder, but said they are hopeful for the future. The day DeAsia Watkins was found guilty, she told the court, I loved her regardless of what anybody says. The family has never found out what led the woman to the brutal murder of her baby. In August 2018, a distressed Ohio police officer contacted 911 and told them that his wife, Kaylee Hastoski, has just shot him in the arm. Then, hours later, they made a bleak discovery. 911, state emergency. One five two Cedar Brook Road. My wife just shot me. Please. Okay. Where are you shot at? My arm. Okay. How old are you? Billy, stop. Twenty five. 
I'm an off duty police officer. I'm locked in the okay. basement. She's shooting through the door. Please help me. Okay. I, stay on the phone with me. I've got, I've got help coming. Me. She's going to kill me. She already shot me through right. the door. Stay. She shot you through the door? Yeah. All right. I'm yeah. Out, out over okay. The place. Do you have something, a belt, a shirt, something that you can tie around that, like a tourniquet? I don't. I, I something. Really don't do you shirt. have a shirt on? Do you have a pair of pants? Whatever you have, I need you to take it off and tie it tight. <laughs> right where the wound's at, okay? Why are you If you want to keep up to date with all the latest true crime, be sure to like this video and hit subscribe to be notified of all our videos. 27-year-old Dylan Hostoski, a well-respected Gates Mills police officer, lived with his 29-year-old wife, Kaylee, their three-year-old son, and small dog in a double-story home in Painesville at 152 Cedar Brook Drive. The couple had been married for almost three years and lived in the city for about two years. Police responded to the call about 4.15 p.m. on Monday, the 13th of August, 2018. When they arrived at the crime scene, they found Dylan lying in the driveway of Heritage Middle School, a stone's throw away from the home, with two bullets in his left arm. He was immediately taken to TriPoint Medical Center and was stabilized before being transferred to Metro Health for treatment and surgery. Police attempted to make contact with Cable, who allegedly did not take their calls or unlock the door to the home. Instead of coming into contact with her, police called in the Lake County SWAT team, who sent drones into the house. At about 7.42 p.m., Kaylee was found in the home with a single gunshot wound. The preliminary autopsy report found that the death was a suicide, but the body was taken to Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office for an autopsy and a final report. The couple's baby was with Kaylee's sister in Stowe at the time of the standoff. The couple's pet dog was unharmed and was given to Dylan's mother after the incident. Heritage Elementary School closed for the day. Dylan underwent successful surgery the following day, and he made a full recovery. Police have confirmed that the weapon Kaylee used to shoot both herself and Dylan was not a service weapon. Authorities reported not knowing where Kaylee had acquired the gun. In a press conference held the next day on August 14th, Gates Mills Police Chief Greg Minicello told reporters that Dylan had served as an officer for four and a half years. He described him as an outstanding employee and said that he had wished he had 10 of him. He also extended his condolences to the Hustoski family. To date, there is no solid information as to why this happened and what caused Kaylee to attack her husband and then take her own life. A Washington woman called 911 after she slashed her three babies with a kitchen knife in an attempt to keep them silent and from disturbing her husband. Special Forces soldier Thomas Booth. 29-year-old Christina Booth made this chilling call. The attack took those who knew the mother by surprise, saying she was a kind and loving parent. 911, you're reporting. Hi, ma'am. Hi, this is 911. Yes. What's going on there? Please help me. What address are you at? Okay, what's going on there? Oh, my babies will go down. I breastfed them. I pulled them and fed them. And what, what are they doing? And what are they doing? They're not calming down. What do you mean no. calming down? They're not calming down. Down. Are they repeatedly crying? Yes. So they are conscious? Yes. Okay, and do you think they need medical attention? Yes, I don't know what they want. Okay. How many children do you have? I have four. Okay, and, and are they all four not calming down? Yes. Okay, what's going on there? 
Yes, we need an ambulance immediately for two okay. babies. Okay, what's going on there? Okay, and what's going on with the babies? Uh, they're bleeding right now. We need we need an ambulance immediately. Where are they bleeding from? The neck. We we need we need an ambulance. My part my partner is talk my partner is talking to them. Why are they bleeding? What happened to them? I'm not sure. Send the ambulance immediately. Okay. Please. Something is so wrong there. January 25th, 2015 began as a quiet movie night with a few glasses of wine and ended in tears and bloodshed. Towards the end of the movie, Christina had gotten up to take her two-year-old daughter up to bed. When she got back, her twins would not stop crying. The mother of the three, who was inebriated at the time, snapped, slicing her baby's throats. Her husband, Thomas Booth, a special forces soldier, told police that he realized that something was wrong when Booth appeared in the living room in only her underwear, screaming and crying. He reported that he tried to save the babies himself with the medical kit, whilst ordering his wife to call 911. Following the call, two police officers arrived at the Olympia home to find six-month-old twin girls lying on the couch, crying uncontrollably and bleeding from their necks. They also reported finding a two-year-old girl in her bed upstairs covered in dried blood. All three children were rushed to a local hospital where they underwent surgery and were stabilized. Christina Booth was arrested on three counts of attempted murder with bail set at $3 million. According to authorities, Thomas Booth was not suspected of a crime. The accused adoptive mother, Carla Peterson, told the court that her adopted daughter had witnessed traumatic events from a young age starting with the rape and murder of her biological mother. Peterson went on to say that Christina had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. As a teenager, she fell pregnant and was later diagnosed with postpartum depression following the birth of her now 12-year-old son. Peterson believed that the stress of having twins who were also born prematurely sent the young mother right back to suffering from her PTSD. I think she acted out of desperation that night, Peterson said. She became that scared little girl again. Thomas Booth described his wife as kind, sweet, and loving. He said Christina had never been violent before and that the events of that night came as a complete shock to him. Christina Booth pleaded guilty in September 2015 to one count of first-degree assault of a child armed with a deadly weapon and two counts of second-degree assault while armed with a deadly weapon. She was sentenced to 14 years and six months in prison. She told the court, I hate myself very much. I'm disgusted with myself. I'm not going to forgive myself. Thomas Booth has custody of the three girls who also spend a lot of time with their adoptive grandmother at her home in Seattle. The father says they are all doing well and that he plans to stay by his wife's side. Mona Stilwell made this desperate, frantic call from Woods Mill Drive near Lake Washington in January 2019. Barely anything is said directly to the dispatcher, and the chaos plays out in the call's background. For more true 911 calls, interviews, and updates, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Malware number one with the location to the emergency. Okay, stay on the stay on the phone. I need to get you through to medical. Don't hang up. Ma'am, who was who shot him? Brevard, we've got a shot, a uh, gunshot victim, 3243 Woods Mill. Okay. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am. 
Ma'am. No, no, please. How many people were shot? She just said the father was, and she said several times that he may be dead. I'm going to stay on the line. Nobody's talking to me. Is anybody there? Melbourne police arrived on the scene just after 3 o'clock on New Year's Day after receiving a call from the neighbor, Phil McMahon. He reported that he thought he had heard someone setting off fireworks until moments later. Father showed up at his doorstep, holding his hip where he had been shot, saying that he had been shot and urged Phil to call 911. 911, that emergency. What's the location of your emergency? Yeah, come in. Yes, sir, 3231. With no drive, come quick. Okay, we've got. Okay, we're getting multiple calls from that location. Are you Are you there now? Yes, I'm there now. Did you witness the shooting? Yes. Just a second ago. With no drive. Okay, we got police and fire going. Are you Are you with the person now? Um, they went to my house, but I I've been there. The put you on the call. And I don't know if they who's Who's there? Are you at the house? I'm in the other house. They're, they're, they, the hap, it happened next door. Okay. They so you're, you're not the there? Who exactly was shot? Do you know? No, I did not get shot. Like, come quick. It's 3231. Okay. Yeah, they're coming quick, sir. I got them on the way. I'm just trying to get additional information. You're not there. You don't um, see anybody? My neighbor, no, my neighbor's there. Um, there was next door, and this happened next door. I understand. my house. But you didn't see anything? You just know about it, correct? Yeah. I, I just want briefly... Um, there was a gentleman, um, and he's the one um, that was in there. I just hear shooting, and it was right next door. Okay. All right. Well, we've got police and fire coming to you, sir, and uh, stay inside away from where it's, okay. where it's occurring, all right? Okay. Here. All right. Here. All right. 
Yeah, they have to put pressure on it. Are you with, water. Are you with the person now? I'm with two, two, two people that got shot. Two people got shot. Okay, I'm going to put you through the medical. They're yeah, going to get you to stay on the line when they don't hang up. Um, heard loud noises from gunshots next door. Um, didn't know what it was. Yeah, I know, man. They're coming. Um, there's the daughters and there's other kids there. Um, we don't know um, their status. Um, but there was a gentleman that was a gun that was doing open fire. Um, they shot two of my neighbors. Um, they got shot near the hips. Um, they're in the house here, but I don't know about the rest of the rest of the people. Okay, how old is the one person that was shot? Um, both of them are like 50, 60. Is that female, male? Male, I'm conscious. Um, yeah, they're conscious. We're just putting pressure on the the wounded area. Okay, and do we know how many other people are inside the house? Um, it's a, a daughter and kids. We how many know kids? How many kids? Um, let me ask. Um, so, um, do you know, you know how many? You know who was there? How many? You're asking how many kids? Um, a daughter and two children. Two kids? Okay. And, uh, and, it, and it was actually her husband doing it. Okay. All right. And you said you do direct pressure on the two people that were shot? Yes. One is sitting down. The other um, gentleman, um, he, um, he should um, he should sit down, please. Okay. Yeah. And they're he, he at your house? Walk. They're right, both right. at your house, but the shooting yeah. next door, is that correct? Correct. According to the police report, 39-year-old William Brian Stilwell crashed a small family gathering with a 9mm semi-automatic pistol and began to shoot. Both Mona's parents, Robert and Naima Snellgrove, were shot. Robert had been shot in the groin, and Naima was shot in the abdomen and the elbow. All three victims were transported to the nearest hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The couple's two five-year-old children were in the home at the time and witnessed the ordeal but were not injured. In the initial 911 call made by Mona, one of the twin children can be heard begging their father to put down the gun and pleading, I don't want any of you to die. I don't want you to die. Neighbor Phil McMahon spoke to Six News about the couple. They've been having some, some issues with her husband and she was staying at her mother's house. And so he showed up with a gun and he started shooting everybody. Stillwell was arrested and taken to the Brevard County Jail and charged with three counts of felony attempted murder, child abuse, concealing a firearm, and home invasion without bond. There haven't been any further updates on this case, but the victims all fully recovered. In March 2018, a Washington state woman brutally attacked her boyfriend with a samurai sword in their bedroom after discovering that he had a Tinder profile that she believed he used to cheat on her. 911, can I help you? I just stabbed my boyfriend. Okay, what is the address there? Yeah, it's Washington. Okay, did you die? Okay, and tell me, tell me what happened. Okay, what? Okay, is he awake? He's dead, I think he's dead. Okay, what is your name? Emily. Okay, Emily, I need to get some help started. I'm splitting the call. Hold on just one. Okay, stay on, Emily. Stay on the phone with me just a second, okay? Uh, Emily, stay on the phone. I'm, I'm splitting it for medical so we can get help started for you, okay? Stay on the line with me. Okay. Emily, what's your last name? Okay, where did you stab him? No, where where on his body? Where on his body? Everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. It can you get a clean dry cloth or a towel and put it right on the Okay. Emily, Emily, where is the knife right now? Emily, hey, we have lots of help coming, Emily, okay? 
Are you sure that he's not awake right now? What? Can, are you able to go in the room? Okay, Emily, can you go in the room? Okay, who else? Emily, who else is in the house? Just me and him and the dog with the dog in the backyard. Okay, where is the knife? He's fighting him. I use a sword. You used a sword? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, Emily, if 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 it's possible for you to go in there to to him, we may be able to help him if you can put put a okay. Okay, we're coming as quickly as we can. Okay, so the sword is in there with him. What? The sword is in the room with him. Okay, Emily, 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 listen to me. We may be able to help him. Okay, I need for you to take a breath. Okay. Emily, listen to me, okay? Or, so you're not willing to go in there? Because I can give you instructions for how to for how to help him. Okay? Okay, Emily, how do you spell it? Okay, take a breath for me. We're on our way to you. We're on our way, Emily. What is what is his name? Alex Lovell. Alex what? Lovell. Lovell is okay. Yes. Are there are there any other weapons in the house, Emily? Any guns or other knives? In the bedroom. Okay. Please Do you help. live? We're coming, Emily. We're on our way. Do you live there together? Yes, this is house. Okay. Okay, Emily. We're we're on our way. I need for you to try to stay calm for me, okay? And make sure. Where are they? They're coming. They're coming to you now. Is your door unlocked, or Emily? They're on their way as fast as they can. Is your door unlocked already? Okay, Emily. How how old is Alex? I don't know. Twenty nine. Okay, they're coming. They're coming to you as fast as they can. According to detectives, the jealous 30-year-old had been plotting to kill her 29-year-old boyfriend of two years, Alex Biggie Lovell, for about a week after finding the Tinder app on his cell phone, as well as suspicious scratch marks on his back and strands of hair that were not hers in their shower. She had bought the sword from a store in Vancouver Mall a week before the incident, and she also taped two knives to the side of their bed. Although when Lovell came home and ignored her that Friday night, she was pushed over the edge and decided to make her deadly move. Emily Javier allegedly got her boyfriend drunk on the night of the attack and waited for him to go to bed. Lovell was reportedly sleeping next to her when she hit his cell phone to stop him from calling for help and began to attack him with the sword at approximately 2 a.m. Lovell reportedly blocked her attacks on his throat with his limbs, eventually bear-hugging her and begging her to stop. He managed to convince her to call 911. Javier called 911 frantically, thinking that she may have actually killed him. Police found Lovell on the bedroom floor, covered in blood, suffering from life-threatening injuries. Lovell was rushed to the nearest hospital, and his critical injuries were treated, although doctors said there would be more surgeries ahead. He reportedly credits his survival to his video gaming skills. Emily Javier was arrested and charged with attempted murder. Neighbors were shocked by the chaos caused by this little Camos family mainly because the home which the incident happened was only a stone's throw away from an elementary school. According to Lovell, Javier had been an extremely jealous girlfriend and frequently woke him at night, accusing him of cheating on her if a girl had liked his photo on Facebook. Lovell also reported that Javier was upset with his decision to become a professional video gamer. Javier pleaded guilty to attempted first-degree domestic violence murder, the following January at Clark County Superior Court and was sentenced to 19 years in prison for her crime. Thirty-five-year-old Mercedes Robb from Turtle Creek Township in Warren County called 911 in November 2016 to report that she had shot her ex-husband, 36-year-old Jason Robb, and she did it on purpose. Want to hear more true crime stories? Subscribe to our channel and hit that notifications button for the latest updates. Dispatch, Andrew. Hello? 
Hi, I just shot my ex-husband. Can somebody please come out here, please? So what's your address? 3112 Oregon Road. 3112 Oregon Road? Mm-hmm. My kids are sleeping. Can somebody please And wh wh what exactly happened? I shot him. Okay. Was this accidental or on purpose? On purpose. He was going to hurt my kids. And this was your husband? Ex-husband. Please hurry. How long ago did you do this? I just did it. Oh, Is he still breathing? No. Do you want to attempt CPR? No. I okay. thought he was going to hurt my kids. Okay, ma'am. I understand that. But at any point in time, you, we, you know, if you want to attempt CPR, let me know. And we'll go through this, okay? No, I don't want to. He's done. He's gone. And my kids are sleeping. Okay, I understand that, ma'am. Stay on the phone with me, okay? Yeah. Okay, do you still have that weapon? Yep, I've got it right here next to me. I'm guilty, I did it. I understand that, ma'am. Where'd you shoot him at? What part of the body? I don't know. I just shot a couple times. I don't know. What you, you said twice in the chest? I don't know how many times. <laughs> Oh, fuck. You're not thinking about harming anybody else, are you? No, 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 no. You're not thinking about harming yourself, are you? No. Are you not thinking about harming the police or anybody like that? No, 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 no. I didn't protect the kids. Okay. What happened when you say to protect the kids? What happened? Okay. And you said you just did this, correct? Yeah, please hurry. Ma'am, I understand. Okay. I understand that, ma'am, okay? Well, I've got units on the way already. What, uh, what's your last name, ma'am? Uh, Rob, R-O-B-B. That's your last name? I understand that, ma'am. I had You broke up on me for a second. What's your last name? Rob, R-O-B-B. And what's your first name? Mercedes. I'm gonna, I was going to kill myself and then I couldn't do it. Okay, well we don't want to harm anybody else including yourself right now, okay? No. What is that weapon at? Right there, three. Is it a pistol, rifle, shotgun? What kind of weapon is it? What it is. I don't know. You don't know if it's a pistol or a rifle? It me a long time ago. I don't know. It's a little one. Like a pistol? I guess so. I don't know what you call it. Okay. It's got a very short barrel. You can hold it with one hand. Yeah, I'm not going to hurt anybody. I swear uh, to God. I understand that, ma'am. I'm just giving my officers as much information as possible, okay? Can they, are they going to send people out so they can take my kids? I don't want them to see him because they love him, but they just don't know any better. I, I understand that, ma'am. And you're sure you're at 3112 Oregonia Road, correct? Yeah. Okay. I want to call my mom. Okay, well, no, we're just on the phone with me right now until we get there, okay? Are you guys quarrels? I can't even look at this. I understand, okay? <laughs> where, where are you at right now, ma'am? Sitting on the front porch. Oh, my God. I'm going to need you to put that weapon down, okay? We got officers coming out to you, and we don't want an accent to happen or anything like that, okay? It, I swear to God. Where is it at? Can you put it to the side away from me and walk away from it? It is. It is. It's to the side of me. Can they turn their sirens off? It's going to wake my kids up. I hear them coming. Can you tell them to turn the sirens off? Okay. I'm not going to hurt anybody. It's on the right side of the porch and on the left side. I'm not a violent person. I'm not. Alrighty, ma'am. And you're sure he's not breathing, correct? No. Uh, affirmative. And you're promising me that weapon is nowhere near you, correct? I swear to God. Okay. I swear. Okay. I, swear. I don't want you to get hurt, and I don't want my police officers to get hurt, too, okay? What do you want okay? me to do when they get here? Do you want me to yeah. When the police officers arrive, I want you to put your hands straight up in there so they can see you, okay? And they want to serve their safety and your safety also. Okay. Oh, can they turn their sirens off, please? They're going to wake my kids up. Uh, I, I understand that, ma'am. I've let them know. Unfortunately, policy, they have to do what they got to do, too, for their safety, okay? But we're going to do our best to, to try to make sure they don't, okay? 
How many kids are in the residence? It's my daughter, she's 13, and my son, he's 6. All right, I've got a deputy in the area, okay? Is your porch light on? It is, and I'm sitting right here. Do you want me to leave the phone on while I put my hand Yes, I do, if you would, please, okay? All right. Okay, put your arm straight up in there, okay? Police arrived at the 3100 block of Oregonia Road in the early morning to find the victim dead in the front yard of the home. According to officials, in the weeks before the incident, Jason Robb and his girlfriend Amanda Palm Green had been fighting for custody of Jason and Mercedes's two children. He and Amanda had also recently had a child of their own. Jason had also opened a food truck business to feed the homeless around the same time. On the day of the attack, the victim and father of their two children arrived at the home to pick their children up for school. However, Mercedes had intentionally allowed the children to oversleep as she planned on killing her ex-husband and didn't want them to witness the crime. Upon calling 911, the killer said she had shot him because she feared he would harm her children, who were still asleep. The 35-year-old even requested that the police arrive without their sirens on, as she did not want them to see their father's dead body. She also refused to perform CPR on the victim, claiming that he was already gone. During initial hearings, Mercedes Robb had pleaded insanity, claiming that she was not aware of her actions when she killed her ex-husband. However, this was disputed by prosecution and Jason Robb's family, who claimed that she knew exactly what she was doing. Then, in August 2017, the Turtle Township mother pled guilty to aggravated murder at the Warren County Common Police Court. She was sentenced to 25 years in prison with the chance of parole after 25 years. During the hearing, the victim's mother spoke out against her son's killer. She also wished for Rob to burn in hell and hoped for her to get a horrible disease or extreme prison justice so that she suffers painfully. The couple's children remain in the custody of Jason's parents, Jared and Paulette Rob. A panicked man calls 911, saying demons made him kill his girlfriend, claiming that he has proof to show the police. Then, a home invasion by a famous musician leads to a dramatic 911 call, during which his ex-girlfriend strangles him with the operator on the phone. And a woman calls 911 to report stabbing a drunk man, with him still lying in the bathroom. If you like true 911 calls like these, click the subscribe button below and turn on the bell for notifications. On August 13th, 2017, Daniel Torres Jr. made a panicked 911 call, saying demons had made him kill his girlfriend. The 38-year-old from Hamilton Township told the operator that he had proof that he acted in self-defense. 911, where's Mercy? I'm being threatened. I'm hearing demons. The demons told me to kill my girlfriend. I killed her because you stick the demons on me. This has been happening a long time. I'm going to give you my address. I got proof. I got evidence. I'm very afraid. I got a dog. This been happening so long. Everywhere in my surroundings, all right? I don't want to get killed. I want to bring a poop. I want to talk to somebody before they come up. I want to show them. I want to... Where are check you? check myself in the hospital. This is very serious because Where I... Where are you? Sir. Where are you? This means... I don't want to hurt nobody else. Where are me. you? Okay. Where are you? You need to send somebody up right now because I'm fully armed and I have the dog also and I don't want to start. Where are scared. you? The police tried to kill me twice already. Please. Where are you? My address. But listen to what I'm saying. Stop. I want to Stop. Where are you? <sighs> Where are you? I need somebody to come talk to me first. And you keep somebody. saying that, and you keep that. saying that, but you're not telling me where you are. Where are you? <laughs> I'm very afraid of this happened twice. Please. Okay, I'm going to give you my address. You said that now okay. for the fourth time. Are you going to tell me your address, or are you going to keep saying yeah. you're going to tell me? What's your address? Promise me that they won't kill me. I don't have to shoot and kill nobody else because they tried it. Please, sir, promise me. Did you kill anyone yet? Five, nine. Yes. Who did you kill? The demons told me to do it. They attacked me. Okay. I have all the proof. That's why I need to talk to somebody. Did you just kill? Footage. Did you just kill someone right now? I defended myself. I'm in my house. Okay. Nobody's in here except. 
Who did you kill? Mm. Who did you kill? The demons made it look like it was me. But if she kicked them on me, okay? She was... She, you killed... She was girl I was seeing and dating. That her aunt and so, didn't know that I was texting that she had... Okay, let's... Okay. Uh, uh, so you killed and your girlfriend? Please. Okay, you killed your yeah. girlfriend? So you're telling me you killed your girlfriend for... Somebody... Listen, I defended myself. There's nobody in here, and the demons grabbed me. They threw me all over, and I told her. I even texted her aunt before this. She's been demonized, and she was sticking them on me. Okay, she how did you kill her? How did you kill no her? I had no drug history. How did you Nothing. kill her? I was trying to shoot the demons. I was trying to shoot the demons that grabbed me, and she's laughing at me, and then she has it. I even texted her aunt, yo, there's demons on you. She needs to go to the hospital. Okay, like, oh, where are please. you? We're not going to kill you, but where are you? Sir. I, I'm, they tried twice. I got no warrants, no nothing. No okay, I understand I that. The tried twice, but it's just why. Okay, I, we're I, not going. Right. Listen, we're not going to kill you, but I need to I know have evidence that you wrote letters that. Are you going to? I need to talk to someone. Yes, I give you. You need to promise me that I'll be safe. For if not, I just fucking end myself. It's part of fucking war because that's what they want. All right, getting demonized. You need to promise me that somebody will come up here and talk to me, see what I have. I'm not going to hurt nobody. I just then I'll go. It doesn't matter. I know. That this is real, and I don't want it to get lost. Okay, I already listen. Sent it to my family members. Listen, listen to me. If this listen evidence gets lost, sir, if this evidence gets lost, I'm going to beat this case. I need to show that. Okay, I, I will. Sh I will help you. I want to help you. Okay, listen. I want to help you. I promise you, I will not hurt you. No one will hurt you. I just need to know where you are. Give me your address, and I promise you, we will get the evidence from the demons and all the photos. I just need no, to know I where. It. Where I'm are you? With me. I Where are you? Me. Where? Sir, I'm at 859 South Olden Avenue, okay? Apartment 2, okay? I have evidence and proof, and I want to make sure it goes. And it's apartment 2. I let my, okay, yeah, what is your I let what is, family members know that this is, what is your, with me already. What is your name? The SD cards, I got four of them, and I got video footage and, Does, and letters. Listen, where did you... Demonic attack. Where did you shoot yeah, her? Did you shoot her in the arm? Did you... Where did you shoot her? Is she breathing? Please, sir. It was that... I'm shooting... No. If she's not breathing. No, she's dead. No, sir. I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't mean to kill her. This demon, that's the way. I got proof of evidence here. This has been a demonic attack on me already for a long time. Everybody, please. I need is, to show what's, this what's to your somebody. first name? What's your first name? Daniel. Last name Torres. Torres. Okay. They've been trying, and I've been warning them. They've been trying to kill me. I told the officers. Everybody knows in this neighborhood already. My sister is even in, involved. She told me tonight that they six hundred thousand, more than half a million, for my head. What's your girlfriend's name? Okay. She admitted that she killed. She admitted she took ten thousand dollars in this video and poisoned me. She what? admitted that she set me up three times already, sir. What? what is her name? <laughs> What's your girlfriend's name? She's certain demon attacking me. Her name is Jen Jennifer Beer. Jennifer, Jennifer Beer? Beer? She set all this up. And it happened. I have evidence and proof. I have a So she so she's, she's dead so she's dead right now? Sir. I'm listening. She's dead, sir. It means that you're shooting the demons. They grabbed me and threw me up. She already admitted that she set me up the whole time, sir, the whole time. I got evidence where, of video where, footage of where's, the demonic, demonic effects. I send this to my family members because this happened already. The rumor that I the had gun? that she already Where's the gun? Me. Where's the gun? Yeah, you're not where's like the gun? Just, where's the gun? Where's the gun? It's with me. I have two of them. Where? In I your hand? I have a bulletproof vest, an army bulletproof vest also, and I have a helmet. I'm not feeling safe. You're not telling me that you're going to have this. I'm not, okay. I don't want to hurt nobody else. I defended myself the whole time. I, I have heard. evidence and proof, sir. Okay, listen. I wasn't trying I don't, to hurt her. The I don't me. want you to get hurt, and I don't want anyone else to get, get hurt. hurt. I have American Bulldog. But I don't want I, her to get hurt. Also. But I, I listen. It's been happening a year, sir. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to put the gun down. Can you put the gun down? Sir. Listen, can you put I the gun need, down? Sir, I'm gonna, I, I, I hear, him. listen. My dog is here. Okay, I understand. Oh, listen, listen. I have them both with me, and I don't want, I don't want to hurt nobody. I okay. want to show them and what I have, okay? Listen to me. You need to listen to me, what I'm telling you, okay? 
I don't mm -hmm. want you to get hurt, and I don't want anyone else to get hurt. Sir. The call cut shortly after muffled sounds of chaos. When police arrived on the scene, a gunshot was fired. But Torres shouted that it was an accidental fire. He was dressed in a bulletproof vest and a helmet. Torres's girlfriend, 31-year-old Jennifer Beer, was found with multiple gunshots to her head and chest. One of the couple's dogs was also found fatally wounded. According to her obituary, Beer had two daughters. Although the accused has no prior criminal convictions, he was facing a charge for certain persons not to have weapons. The charge implies Torres had either been convicted of a serious crime in another state or suffers from mental disorders preventing him from handling a firearm. There are unconfirmed reports that Torres was convicted in 2004 of second-degree assault in New York. Torres took a plea deal for manslaughter and animal cruelty and will serve 23 years in prison. He will only be eligible for parole after serving 85% of his 20 years for charges relating to the murder of Beer. It is still unclear what happened before the shooting. Emma Jane Magson called 999 in March 2016 after fatally stabbing her allegedly abusive boyfriend, James Knight, to death. Now, five years later, she is still fighting the justice system on the charges. What an ambulance. Ambulance, tell me exactly what's happened. Um, I don't know. My boyfriend's here and he's making weird noises. I don't know what's going on. Right. What was he doing to make... What, what? I don't know. He's got a lot of blood on him. James, look at me, please. James. James, just look at me. Just James, just turn around. Please. I don't know if he's playing around or he's got some old him. James, turn around. James, I've got the ambulance on the phone. Please, just turn around so I know what's up with you. James, but listen, the ambulance is on the phone, so can you please turn around or let me know what's going on? Please, turn around. He's not doing, now he's not making noises, I don't know. No, he's doing fine, he's just come home, he's come home to me, yeah. so I've been out all night, and then he's come home to me and then just collapsed on my floor. And then now that he was fine about up until five minutes ago and he's just started making noises. Now we stopped and now I'm on the phone to you. And is he awake and breathing and Yeah, he's breathing. Okay. Um No, he's breathing fine, it's like he's asleep, but I don't know why he's making the noises. I don't know if he's doing it for my sake or for what. But James James What? Now it's just like he's asleep. Right, and so do you want do you want an ambulance to come and take him to the hospital? I don't know. I don't know if there's some old room or he's just playing me about. <laughs> but now while I'm on the phone too, he's just shut up. Right. What should I do? I can't tell you. I've not, I'm not not there. <laughs> then I don't know what you want me to do. The only thing I can do is just send an ambulance to come and take him to the hospital if that's what he wants. Yeah, do that, please. Right, oh, okay, so uh, just bear with me then. Um, James, an ambulance is coming, okay? I'm really breathing that normal, but an ambulance is coming, okay? What's your address? Um, 25 Silver Street. What's postcode? Um, Ellie 3. Yep. 9GU. GU, yeah? Yeah. You say Sil Sylvan Street, yeah? Yeah, Sylvan. 25. Mm. Yeah. How old is he? Um, 26, 27. Born in 1999. Yeah. James. <sighs> is his eyes open at all? Is he awake? Well, to be honest, it looks like he's sleeping, but... It ain't how he normally sleeps, because I live with him, so it ain't how he normally sleeps, that makes sense. Right. It looks like he had a fight with someone. Okay. James, I think he's ignoring me on purpose, if I'm honest with you. Right, okay. 
Jake. James, police are on the way. <laughs> Just breathe again. Yeah. You can hear the police are on the way. No. Ignore them there. All right, well, uh, we'll get someone sent over to him. Um, it's been arranged. I mean, it might take a while, so I do apologise. It's bank holiday weekend and we're getting absolutely... Bad. No, that's fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. I mean, if you can... Just keep doing well, it. It looks like he's just asleep, but you know what? It's a bit worrying because normally he gets up and get in bed. Yeah. And um, has he been out drinking all night? Yeah, I'm a bit honest. I think he's took some drugs. Oh, okay. I don't know, though. How's he, how's he lay at the minute? Is he on his front, back, side? How is he lying? He's on his front at the minute. He's on his front, the head's on the front, and the hands are on the front. So what do I do? I mean, we do try and say get him on his side because if he's on his front, that's going to. I don't know, I'm just. Yeah, I don't want to leave him on his front because yeah, it's not good to be lying on his front. You can't breathe properly. It's easy to on his front, but at the same time, you don't. Like, I don't know. Can you get him on his side if you try and move him? Will he. Will he I better call. I better call when I'm off the phone, yeah. Right, um, try and put him on his side. All yeah. right. Um, if he does wake up, just reassure him. Do you know what? I just think he's too smashed. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, that's why. I need to turn the side, like, it's my boyfriend's phone. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I say, if he has, try and get him on his side. Because if he vomits, he'll choke on it, lying on his front. Okay, then. And that's bad. Person there, that's what I think he's on. If anything, he's took coat, because I know him. Right. But, yeah, I mean, try and get him on his side for me. Uh, All right, then. No matter what, don't give him anything to eat or drink, because if he has taken anything else, it can react to it, yeah? All right, then. Um, you have any problems or his breathing changes or anything like that, make sure the rooming is straight away, yeah? OK, then, thank you. Right, no, no worries, thank you. All right, thank you, thank Cheers. you, bye. Bye. On the night of the attack, the couple had been out in Leicester City Centre and argued. 23-year-old Maxon had drunk copious amounts of alcohol, and 26-year-old Knight was drunken and had taken cocaine. It's alleged the victim had been acting aggressively and was kicked out of the bar. Police were called and spoke to him. The couple then took a taxi home, but the driver also asked them to get out when he saw Maxim kicking out Knight. Shortly after, CCTV footage captured Knight pushing Maxon against the car, causing her to fall to the ground. The events of that night became a controversial subject after Maxon appealed her earlier murder conviction. Initially, investigators found the woman caught in a web of lies surrounding the stabbing, which ultimately led to her arrest. She claimed she didn't know what happened to the victim. In body cam footage of police arriving at the house, the woman again fails to mention that Knight had been stabbed. Throughout the trial, Maxon claimed she stabbed the man in self-defense after choking her. Although the judge didn't deny the claims, he noted that Maxon had a jaded past. One of her ex-boyfriends told the court that she had threw a vacuum cleaner at him, which led her to being nicknamed Mike Dyson by friends. Text messages from the victim to the accused were presented in court, in which he repeatedly called her a slag. He also called her fat while pregnant with his child and told her to lose weight. She lost the child during her pregnancy. In the first trial, Maxon was found guilty of murder. However, the Justice for Women organization assisted in quashing the trial and obtaining a retrial. This time, new evidence was submitted, including an admission made by Knight's friend about his abuse towards the accused. Jurors were also shown pictures of red marks on Maxon's neck, which her defense team claimed were caused when he strangled her. They also presented this CCTV footage of him pushing her into the car. Maxon's legal team presented reports where five out of six psychiatric or psychologists gave evidence of a mental impairment that was likely to have diminished the accused's responsibility for the stabbing. It was revealed that Knight had sent similar abusive texts to a previous partner and her sister, cementing abuse allegations. Prison officers gave reports of the accused's work in prison, saying she was dedicated to self-improvement, helped others, and showed remorse for the stabbing. In spite of the new evidence in these accounts, on March 29, 2021, following an eight-week retrial for murder, Emma Jane Maxson was sentenced by Justice Jeremy Baker to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 17 years. Justice for Women quoted Maxson saying, It's a horrible feeling to hurt someone. I wouldn't fight back again. Speaking after the sentencing, her mother said, 
Emma has been convicted because of the lies she told when she was terrified rather than the actual incident, which even the prosecution agreed was not done with an intent to kill. I just don't understand how this aggression and violence, as caught on CCTV, was disregarded. Her last words overheard to him were, I'm not letting you in after last time. It was obvious she was frightened of him. She has nothing but remorse of killing James. Even the prison officers have said that. I can't believe she has been failed by the system again. In the most recent update from Justice for Women, they say Maxon's lawyers are considering grounds of appeal against conviction and sentence. Knight's family described him as a devoted father to two beautiful girls, a loving family man. They say he was a happy, bouncing young man who will always be treasured, adding that they were disappointed that they had to endure the trial. At about 4.15 p.m. on March 22, 2018, Wisconsin dairy farmer Don Sipple opened his door to a distressed young woman. She was covered in mud and had dried blood around her mouth. She said she had been assaulted, so the older man took her inside and called 911. I'm calling 911. What's the address of the emergency? This is Don Sipple calling, and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house, and somebody attacked her, and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn. And, and okay, what is the address you're located at? What? What is the address you are at? E7614, 430th Avenue. Okay. And is she injured? Yeah, she's injured. Her, her mouth has kind of uh, got some blood around it, and her toy, clothes are all torn. Okay. And she's by herself? She's by herself. She walked to my house here just recently. Okay. And can you ask her what her name is? Just hold on a second. Okay. What's your name, ma'am? What? You don't know? She's in kind of bad shape. She just says she don't know. Okay, let me put you on hold. Do not hang up. I'm going to start some help, okay? Sure. All right, Don, you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, what is your middle initial? My middle, middle initial? Yep. A. Okay, and your date of birth? 11 Okay. But it's a young lady that's here that needs help. Yep. Be quick. Yep, I have an ambulance and some officers started that way. Did she say who did this to her? Did she what? Did she say who did this to her? No, she said she was attacked and assaulted and, and she's from Eau Claire. Okay. And uh, did she your name? Did she say where this happened? No, I didn't. I didn't dis discuss that. Okay. Do you want to stay on the phone with me, Don, or? Sure. Okay. Can, so the ambulance is on the way? Yep, ambulance and officers are on their way. I'll stay on the phone with you as long as I can. Okay, I'll, I'll hang on. Okay. Coming for help. You're coming for help. So besides her bleeding from the mouth, do we know what other injuries she has? Does she look like she's injured anywhere else? Yeah, she looks a little bit. There's some other uh, bloody marks on her, her leg a little bit. Okay. And her pants are all torn. Okay. And how old, if you had to guess, how old do you think she is? How old are you, ma'am? Nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. The ambulance is coming. You're going to get help. And so she came on foot, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. She just walked to my door. Okay. Can you ask her who did this to her? Or are you not repeat, that, repeat that, please. Can you ask her who did this to her? Oh, just a second. Do you have any idea who did this to you? <laughs> just, just hold on. No, she, no, she can't. She's uh, pretty distraught, she's up, upset, and uh, okay. uh, I. I can see why. Okay. Don, do you have some type of blanket or something that you could get her to wrap her up? Sure, I can. Okay. Just hold on. I'm going to lay the phone down here a second. Okay. Sir? Yep. She don't have any shoes on. Okay. Hands are all muddied. Okay. I think she's probably walked quite a ways. I don't know without shoes how far she came, but... Right. Okay. And is she outside of your residence, or where is she? No, she's in. I got her inside. She's inside. Okay. Yep. 
she's shivering and all she's cold so um, you had a good idea that I, I should have thought of getting a blanket around her to keep her warm but I got her sitting on a chair okay sounds good I'll keep you on the phone here this is a strange situation one I've never seen and I've been around a long time yeah well it's a good thing you called it's glad she made it somewhere safe anyway well, when, when I got, got her and brought her into the house she wanted me to drive her to to a, to a hospital, but I didn't think I should be doing that. Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. We'll we'll get her the help she needs. We have an ambulance sure. out also. Uh, that's just what she needs. And yep. We'll, we'll get her taken care of. Yep. She's got glasses on. She said maybe I told her she's 19. Okay, yep. And does that, did you say the blood around her mouth looks like it was dry or? Yeah, it's a little on the dry side, yeah. Okay. So it must have happened a while ago. Okay. I think she's walked quite a ways, maybe. Yeah. I don't know how she found it here, but that's okay. Yep. So, Don, do you have any uh, family pets? They're here right now. They're, they're here right now with the, the police officer. Okay. All right, I'll let you go. You speak with him, Don. Thank you. You bet. When a Dunn County deputy and a state trooper arrived at the farmhouse, their first thought was that the woman was a victim of sexual assault. Unable to remember who had attacked her or her name, the bruised and barefoot victim appeared to be suffering disassociative amnesia, but she kept asking for someone called Jason Mengel. Police followed the ambulance as it took the unidentified victim to Mayo Clinic in Eau Claire. Hospital staff and police noticed the word boy cut into her left arm. Then, while being treated, the woman remembered her name and who had attacked her. She said that she was 19-year-old Ezra McCandless and that her ex, Alex Woodworth, had attacked her. She also recalled that the assault had occurred in her vehicle on a muddy road which was very remote. Armed with this information, police began to search the farmhouse's area, but they couldn't find Woodworth that night. In the morning, McCandless was interviewed by Detective Proc, but she couldn't tell him anything more about what had happened. After speaking for just over 30 minutes, the detective left with no reason not to believe her. But later that day, officers followed a trail of muddy footprints and discovered the body of the alleged attacker half hanging out of the back of McCandless's car. A later autopsy revealed 16 stab wounds scattered across the 24-year-old's body spread from his head to his groin. On March 24th, Proc interviewed McCandless once again. Before he told her that Woodworth's body had been found, the self-proclaimed victim still appeared to be suffering memory loss. However, when he revealed that they had discovered her distinctive car, she suddenly remembered specific details about what had happened. McCandless, born Monica Carlin but changed her name in 2015, said that after her Chevy Impala got stuck in the mud, Alex started to attack her. He carved boy in her arm and tried to cut off her clothes, but she managed to get the knife from him and stabbed him anywhere she could in self-defense. But her story didn't match the crime scene. There wasn't enough blood inside the vehicle when McCandless said she stabbed Woodworth, and Woodworth would have had more defensive wounds if her story were true. It also would have been impossible for Woodworth to have scratched Boy into her arm if she had been straddling her as she claimed. When faced with this, McCandless confessed that she had cut the word into her arm herself. After a two-week investigation, McCandless was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. At trial, the state argued that McCandless intentionally murdered Woodworth in a twisted attempt to win back her ex, Jason Mengel. Before taking the fateful drive down the muddy road, McCandless told her ex that an affair she had with Woodworth was a mistake. Then, wanting Woodworth to admit the same, McCandless left to visit him at his home. Feeling something wasn't right, Mengel followed her there on his bicycle. Shortly after he got to the property, two Eau Claire police cruisers arrived. A neighbor had called them and reported a suspicious man cycling back and forth on the street. Mengel was recorded on a police dash cam explaining his concerns about McCandless, but after speaking to McCandless and Woodworth, the officers left believing everything was good. Mengel left shortly after, and then McCandless and Woodworth began the drive that would end in murder. Evidence presented at trial showed that the defendant attacked Woodworth when they were out of the vehicle and that the first stab was to the back of his head and had taken Woodworth by surprise. McCandless took the stand in her defense and stuck to her assertion that she had acted in self-defense. However, her story of how she had gotten the knife from her alleged attacker had changed and she couldn't explain why she had cut Boy into her arm. The jury didn't buy her story and she was convicted in November 2019. A statement by her victim's father said, 
by killing our son, not only did she take our son, she made the world a colder and darker place. McCandless was sentenced in February 2020 to life in prison with the possibility for parole after 50 years when she'll be 72 years old. An Ohio woman called 911 in August 2011 to report her husband's suicide. She told the operator that he had suffocated himself to death. The truth, however, was that it was not a suicide at all. 911, do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Uh, I believe the police. Where are you located? My address is 33400 Karen Drive, Avon Lake. Okay, Sam, one moment. Number 5244690. Avon Lake Police, Kendra. Uh, yes, uh, Officer. Avon Lake Police, Kendra. Uh, yes, uh, Officer Kendra. Um, I just came home from the store, and it looks like my husband is deceased. Okay, I'm, uh, and where is this at? My address is 33400 Karen Drive. Okay, and your name? My name is Jean Karen. Okay. I have an 11-year-old child here. Should I, should I uh, well, take we'll him have, somewhere? Um, we'll have somebody come over there okay. right away. Um, how old is your husband? Uh, he's 50. Let's see, he was born in 56. Okay. So, uh, okay, where is he located? He's in the den in the back of the house. Okay, had he been ailing or? Uh, no, oh. he's, uh, he got a letter from the Internal Revenue Service the other day wanting $17,000, and then the following day he got a letter from uh, some collection company wanting $16,000, and tomorrow they're supposed to sell our home at sheriff's yeah, auction. Like there's uh, 3340. So, I, the Harrington residence. We had had a uh, we had had an yeah. argument. We had had an argument yesterday. Okay. And uh, uh, have you, how close did you get to him? Just now, I mean, his. Does it look like he's he's done something to himself, or? He has he has plastic wrap. It looks like on his head, and there's a roll laying on the floor. He's rolling on the floor. No. Oh, oh there's a has, roll of it on. The there's floor. a roll of it on the floor. It I'm looks sorry. like it came out of. Okay. Came out of the kitchen. Okay. And, and he left a, a one line note. Okay. So I. I Have you? I, I don't know. How, is, have you touched him or anything like that? Does he feel? I, I, I touched his leg. He feels cold. Cold to the touch. Okay. It looks. Like, it looks like there's blood coming out of his mouth or something. I, okay. he, he's facing the back of the sofa, so when, I can't tell. When was the last time you saw him uh, alive? Oh, <clears throat> I was watching TV. I didn't think he got up to go to the bathroom. Maybe two o'clock. Two o'clock in the morning? Two o'clock in the morning, yeah. Okay. Okay. You say there's a child there with you? Yes. My, my son is 11. Son's 11. Where's he at? He's in the front room. Okay. All right. We'll have officers there shortly. Don't don't disturb anything, and uh, okay. they'll let you know. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Jean Harrington and her husband, 55-year-old Michael Gable, lived in their Avon Lake home with their 11-year-old son. The couple reportedly had a rocky marriage filled with constant arguments over their financial situation. Gable, a car salesman, reportedly also had a gambling problem in the past, using the couple's savings from a previously mortgaged home to pay off his gambling debts. Police had also reportedly been called to the house on numerous occasions for domestic disputes. Their marriage had become so strained that the two were sleeping in separate rooms at the time of the incident. Gable's death sparked a three-year investigation, where they concluded that he did not die from suicide but rather homicide. Harrington had called police, telling them that she had just come back from the store when she found her husband dead. Police arrived on the scene and found the victim lying on the couch with a plastic bag over his head. 
They also discovered what appeared to be a typed suicide note that read, This is the only possible way I will be able to feed and provide for my family and keep a roof over their head. Harrington told police that the argument was over their financial difficulties, saying that they had received multiple bills and that their home would be auctioned if they could not pay them. Gable had a $375,000 life policy, and as police continued their investigation, they became more and more suspicious of the victim's wife. During the alleged mutual fight, Harrington had attacked her husband at least 20 times with a stun gun. She claimed the attack was in response to him biting her arm, and that she had stunned him to subdue him, but there was no evidence to substantiate this claim. Upon further investigations, authorities found that Michael also suffered trauma to his face and extremities, with what the autopsy report stated was a blunt object as well as electrical burns. Police began piecing together an incident that was not suicide at all, but rather that Harrington had murdered her husband as a result of their soured relationship and financial difficulties. They believed that because she could not afford a divorce, she killed him to cash in on his life insurance policy and staged his death to look like a suicide. Police had sent the suicide note in for DNA profiling, and the results came back with what they thought they would find. They did not find Gables, but Harrington's DNA on the note. In 2014, at the age of 56, Jean Harrington was arrested for the murder of her husband, Michael Gable, and in 2016, she was sentenced to a minimum of 16 years behind bars for her crime. Upon the time of Harrington's arrest, their son was turned over to Gable's son from another marriage for care. Lauren Gable, the victim's daughter, spoke out in court wishing that the sentence had been longer and stating that her father had told her before that Harrington was a dangerous woman. These are terrible crimes done in a very, very awful way, and I think she's still harboring some of that inside her, so I don't think they'll let her out anytime soon. In March 2017, 44-year-old Nicola Lee called 911 to report that her partner, Paul Taylor, had stabbed himself with a kitchen knife during an argument. But the shocking truth was far more sinister. No for me, please. Hiya. I need the police. I need some assistance, please. Okay, why do you need the police? Yeah, I do I. Why? What's happened? Why, um, my partner is in the kitchen, he's on the floor, and we've ended up having an argument. He stabbed himself, right? It's not the first time he's done it. The last time, he smashed himself in the head with a hammer, and I just need him out of me properly. I need is, him is out he badly of injured? Me. Is he badly injured? I don't know. He's on the floor. Right, what's your I name? I'm out of the way. What's your name? Tell knife. me your name, please. Tell me your name. My name's Nicola. Nicola Lee. Right. What's right. the address, Nicola? And um, you don't know. You don't know how bad the injury is now. Is he conscious? I don't know. I've come out of the way because he's tried to sell about it. He's really punched me all over, and he's tried to cut himself with a knife. And he's lying. Has he, he, he definitely? Has he definitely cut himself already? Yeah. He's, yes, he's, he's he actually has. stabbed himself. Right, yes he has. Right. Stay on the phone with me, okay? Kitchen now. He's, uh, no, he's unconscious. Paul? 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 Look at us. Look at us. Paul, look at us. Is he unconscious? No, he's not. He's semi-conscious. He stabbed himself in the chest. Right. Has he lost a lot of blood? No. No. He what do you use to stab himself? Right, man. And I'm sick of it because he does it on purpose and he blames me. Paul. What do you use to stab himself? A knife. Right, what sort of knife has he used, Nicola? Um, it's a big kitchen knife. I'm going to turn the music down because I've been sitting in the kitchen with him all night. Right, he's a lunatic. And I'm sick of this <laughs> Paul. Paul, stop it. Is he still Paul? conscious, yeah? Look, Aris. Paul, look, Aris. Paul. Paul. Look, Aris. 
Like I was, no, he's not. He's um, semi-conscious. Right. What's Paul's surname? His name's Paul Taylor. Right. Are we... We're going as quick as we can, OK? We'll not be far. I'm not responding. Right. We're not far now, OK? Paul. Paul. Please, baby. Please. Please. Please, baby. The door's open. Please. I'm in the kitchen with it. Please, baby. Step away from the door. According to police, the couple had been having a drunken argument that turned south when the 45-year-old was fatally stabbed through the heart in the kitchen of the Ashington home. Lee had told police that the victim had allegedly stabbed himself, but this was quickly discounted by authorities and Nicola Lee was arrested for murder. In the following footage, we can see Lee become aggressive and swearing at police while being arrested. Although the accused stuck with her story of her partner stabbing himself in proceedings at Newcastle Crown Court, Nicola Lee was cleared of murder in 2019, but charged with manslaughter and sentenced to prison for 14 years. She has been described as a wicked, evil, dangerous, vivacious, and manipulative woman whose, according to the judge, behavior worsens when she consumes alcohol. Paul Taylor was remembered by family as a fun-loving man. They were thankful to the police for their support. In August 2018, Peggy Bowers, age 67, called 911 after she came home from grocery shopping to find her roommate, Joan Staub, covered in blood after being bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat. 911, what's your birthday? I need an ambulance and a cop. Joan's full of blood, the baseball bat's full of blood. The front door was open. Is anybody in the house? I didn't see nobody. I'd be dead if I'm looking. So your phone, your home was broken into. On the upper side, the baseball bat full of blood, laid on the floor, and Gum's face is covered in blood. Who's 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 covered in blood? Gum stop. Okay, so he was inside the house. It's a she. She was inside the house? Yeah, her whole face is covered with blood. She's breathing bad. Is she breathing? Is she breathing? I don't know her in this place. Her legs are hot. Jump. Jump. I don't know her whole face is covered in blood. I'm shaking her, but she's not answering me. Okay, I'm getting the police on the way there. Oh. And your telephones are gone. You said the phones are gone? Her three phones are gone. And her money clip. That's got money, ID, boost in card, all that's gone. Okay. Hold on one second. Please don't hang up. I, I got him on the way there. I got an ambulance on the way there also. Please don't hang up. I won't hang up. I'm scared to go to the house. The murder of Joan Staub, a well-known member of the community, shocked and distraught the Rosewood neighborhood. Staub was reportedly known as a giving and talkative person and was always willing to help her neighbors, and she had lived in Rosewood for decades. The motive for the killing and the events that led to the attack remains unknown, but the caller, Peggy Bowers, was arrested and charged with murder. According to people close to her, 
Bowers had a history of homelessness and mental health issues. Neighbors reported that Bowers was friendly, but also had a volatile side. Community members had often assisted the elderly woman with a place to stay. One of those members was Joan Staub. Community members believed the pair were close friends, almost inseparable at a time. The coroner's report said the 57-year-old victim died from blunt force trauma to the head. DNA evidence collected on the scene led to Bowers' arrest, and she was taken into police custody. Although she was briefly released, her bond was revoked, and Bowers spent over two years in jail awaiting trial. A trial date had been set for later in 2021, but prosecution and defense instead worked out a plea deal known as an Alford plea. This plea maintains that Bowers did not commit the crime, but pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter to avoid court proceedings and the possibility of a longer sentence. According to the defense, this was the better solution at her age and mental health history. In June 2019, a woman called 911 to report that she had stabbed a man who was still in her apartment. The woman tells the operator he is still alive, but isn't conscious. During the call, the woman's children and another unknown adult can be heard in the background. Yes, ma'am. I, I need an ambulance and the police to... A man was in my house drunk and he tried to hit my kids and I stabbed him. He was laying on my bathroom floor. Okay. And he banged his ring on like I was trying to... And you said you got into a fight? Yes, I was trying to protect the kids. My son got whelped on him. He was drunk and he was uh, trying who to fight the, me and the kids. Who was the guy? He got okay. green and bad, so... Okay. And he's in on your f bathroom floor? Yeah, he's in my bathroom and it's like okay. the whole floor is bloody. Okay, give me just a second here. Hold the line for the ambulance. Don't hang up. <laughs> Hi, this is Mark. Yes, ma'am. I need an ambulance. Uh. All right, what's up, y'all? Okay. What, what's going on? Uh, I, there was a fight because um, some guy was drunk in my house and he was trying to hit on my kids, so I stabbed him. And he punched me in my face, and I didn't know what else to do. Because he wouldn't leave, and I asked him to leave my apartment. All right, is he still there? Yes, he's in my bathroom bleeding like bad. Okay. He walked in the bathroom and just fell out. Okay, is he awake? Is he still breathing? Yes, there's a pulse. Like, okay, but that's coming out. I'm worried. Okay, you said he's breathing, but is he awake? No, he's like passed out because he's drunk too. He had like six beers and uh, Long Island iced tea. Okay, and where was he? Where did you stab him? Uh, in his chest. In his chest. And what did you stab him with? A uh, knife. I have a knife on. Y'all don't touch that knife, boy. Is it still? Is this is the knife still in him? No, it's out of him. But I have the. It's the. Okay. I have the knife. Okay. And it's is there? The couch. Is there serious bleeding right now? Yes, it's like dashing. Okay. All right. So here's what I'm going to have you do. Are you? If you said he's still he's still unconscious on the floor. Yes, ma'am. Are you sure that he's breathing? Yeah. Is he breathing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's breathing. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding, so we can slow it down a little bit. Okay. Okay. So listen carefully so we make sure we do it right. I'm going to get, have you get a clean, dry cloth or a towel and tell me when you have it. Uh, a paper towel? A cloth or a towel? I don't have no towels when they're, like, all dirty. Can I use, like, a, a okay. dirty towel? Uh, no, don't use a dirty towel. Do you have a, a clean T-shirt or a pair of pants? Yeah, I'm about to look for a pair of pants. Okay. Oh, Lord, how mercy. <laughs> I got a pair of pants. What do, he's, like, kind of heavy. Do I just get it underneath him because he's laying on it? 
where I stabbed him from. He's laying on. Are you able to flip him over at all? It's, he's like heavy. You, you said you stabbed. You said you stabbed him in the chest. Yeah, he's like I don't know if he's breathing anymore. Okay. You, you're not sure if he's breathing. Do you see him? It's real slow though. Okay. Is there anybody there that can help you flip him over on his on like, on his back? They said flip him over. This is like. Uh, he's what now? Heavy. He's heavy. And it's just me and his neighbor. Oh Lord. Is he breathing? It's like real slow. It's just, it's, he, it, come on now. I don't I don't think he's breathing no more. <laughs> oh my god. I'm I don't think he's breathing. His eyes are like, okay. look like he's dead. Alright, we're gonna try and do CPR if you're not sure he's breathing. Okay, you you heard it yet? Um, because I'm about to cry. Because I didn't mean to stab him, but I didn't know what else to do because he was so big and wouldn't breathe. Okay, it's all right. If you, do you have him on his back? Yeah, I got him on his back. Okay, do you have him on his back? No, we can't. Like, you can't. We got to put him on his back. I can't. Okay. If, you can't if you can't flip him, that's okay, okay? They should be up to you in a few seconds, but if it's you like can't. It's like halfway flip. Is he on his side? I, I'm, like, about to, I'm about to, like, panic. It's okay. Take a deep breath, okay? I didn't mean to stab him. It's okay. Take a deep breath, okay? Are you, can you put your put your ear to his his mouth to make sure he's breathing? Can you put your ear to his mouth to make sure he's breathing? Oh my God! Is, is the ambulance coming? Yep, they're on their way up to you. Okay, they should be there in a few seconds. I I got a newborn and everything in here, so I had to protect myself. Okay, it's all right. Oh, my gosh, if somebody heard that, like... They're, they're coming as fast as they can, I promise, okay? Oh, my gosh, please. Okay, do you see... Do, is there anybody you can send out to see if the police should be there? And the ambulance is oh. right behind them. Yeah. He's, he's not even... I don't think he's... I don't know. Okay. If he's on his back, we can't do... If he's, if he's on his stomach, you can't do CPR. He has to be on his back. He gotta be on his back. Oh my god. Oh my god. Can you help? Like, I can't. Oh my god, what did I do? It's okay. Are you? Is the neighbor able to help you flip him or they can't help yeah, you? He said he's, 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 I don't think. Can somebody go open the door for the police? The police are there. It's okay. And the paramedics, uh, so we need them to somebody to go open the door for them. My kids. Ma'am, did you go open the door? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me know when Pete when you see police, okay? You got to push it. Oh my God. I don't think I, oh my God. Are you sending one of the kids to open the door for the police? Yes. Or are you able to go open the door for the police? Okay, they're in. When authorities arrived at the Kendis Circle apartment just before 3 a.m., the man had bled to death on the bathroom floor. He was later identified as 36-year-old Eugene Jones Jr. The caller, who was later identified as 32-year-old Ashley Marie Island, alleged that Jones punched her in the face and tried to attack her children before she stabbed him. It is unclear whether Island and Jones were in a relationship. Island was held on a $250,000 bond for the stabbing. Last year, Island was arrested for three charges of endangering children unrelated to the stabbing. Police visited the apartment after a foul smell was reported and, on arrival, confirmed the unbearable odor. Investigations say the smell was coming from trash bags that were filling the apartment. Additionally, police found the children's beds were dirty and without sheets, as well as a pot of spoiled hot dogs covered in flies in the kitchen. The mother then handed herself in after she was issued with an active warrant. There are no further updates on Island stabbing Jones's case. 
and the three counts of endangering children are ongoing. Thirty-five-year-old Damian Berry of Blackburn was stabbed multiple times and robbed by a man who was supposed to be his friend, Lindsay Harkin, in July 2020. He had reportedly taken the man in and was stabbed for his kindness. Put that around your neck and hold it there. Don't move. Uh -huh. I'm going to die. Sit down. Sit down. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear him. He's just been stabbed. He's oh, so I'm leaving out. He's bleeding out. I need an ambulance straight away. Right. The police. Listen, just calm down. Please. I need to know where you are. Poor Holland Bank Street. Blackburn. I'm holding this guy's neck to stop him from bleeding to death. Right, just hold the line while I get help on the uh, way. Thank you very much. Just I'm, 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 I'm going to die. You're not going to die. I'm leaving the walls of home. I'll be, what, what hand? You stabbed me in my neck. Christ. I'm going to die. You're not going to die. I'm going to make sure you, you don't, don't die. Listen, listen, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave the ambulance and the police on the way, okay? Thank you. Oh, thank you. you. Stay Don't the worry the about the blood. Stay on you the stay phone. Stay there. Right, nice one. It's coming out. Don't it's worry it. about it. Just keep it there. Please. I'm going to save you, mate. I'm going to die. You're not going to die. Hurry up, love. Please. It's all right. Listen, me being on the top. Everywhere. Listen, it's not... He's got blood please. everywhere. He's just had his nose sweat. Yeah, just listen to me. Right. Please. The police and the ambulance are already en route. We're not delaying anything. But please. I need to know... Thank you very much. Listen, I need to know... Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Stop right. breathing. Oh, Calm down. I'm gonna die. You're not gonna die. Calm down. I'm gonna pass out. Who stabbed him? That they just stabbed him. They slit his throat. He's standing outside the gate while he's lying down now, but and they stabbed him in his back. I've got blood all over there, all over the street outside. You know what? I'm um, gonna be quick. I'm gonna die. He's uh, starting to pass out. In the moments before the call was made, CCTV footage shows a man, 29-year-old Lindsay Joey Harkin, running down the road, clutching a knife and cell phone. Moments later, Damian Barry is seen staggering from around the corner. The closer he gets to the footage, the clearer the blood on his clothes is. He manages to knock on the door of a homeowner on the street and calls 999 just before Barry can be seen collapsing on the street. In the call, Barry can be heard screaming, I'm going to die. The victim was rushed to the Royal Preston Hospital, where he received life-saving treatment for his 18 stab wounds. In October 2020, Lindsay Harkin was sentenced to nine years in prison after pleading guilty to wounding, robbery, and possession of a bladed article. According to police, Mr. Barry gave the defendant food and clothes, but after drugs and alcohol were consumed, Harkin robbed him. He took 55 euros in cash, as well as his debit card, before stabbing him across the body with a kitchen knife. Harkin befriended his victim and took advantage of him. Steve Monroe of Lancashire Police said, The level of violence which was used in this attack on a vulnerable man, resulting in multiple serious injuries, is totally intolerable. In his victim statement, Barry spoke of Harkin and said, I will help anyone and have a kind and caring nature. I helped out Joey and can't believe he attacked me. I gave him clothes and food from my cupboard. Due to trauma and a real fear of being stabbed again, Barry removed himself from the Blackburn area entirely and moved to Yorkshire. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you want more compilations like this, let me know in the comments. For more True 911, watch this episode next.